There's an old Zen saying, sitting quietly, doing nothing, spring comes and grass grows by itself. Nature depends on self-organization. Trees grow, animals find food, and they cooperate with each other, and all of this activity is done without human direction. We don't need an act of Congress or even an executive order for monarch butterflies to change their migration patterns or for ants to find food. And the same is true for our bodies. All of our internal systems are like our nervous system, our circulation system, our immune system. They all self-organize. We don't need to think or direct any of it. And our bodies just figure out, figures out what it needs to do, and then it makes it so. So if our bodies can self-organize, why can't we self-organize in our work? Why is it so difficult to believe that human beings can direct their own learning or their own work? Why do we structure our organizations in such a way that reinforces command and control? And why, instead, couldn't we design our organizations to unleash this initiative in our staff? So when I was an early first-time supervisor, my staff used to line up outside my office door, and they would um, come in and ask questions and ask me to make decisions for them and solve problems, and then they'd go off and do their work. And when um, I, and because I was a new supervisor, I thought this was what I was supposed to do. This was what a supervisor was supposed to do. But then that later that year, um, my older sister, died of cancer, and I knew the connection between stress and cancer. And so I decided that I would shift some things in my lifestyle, and I started exercising in the morning before I came into work. So instead of getting to work at 7.30, I got to work at 8.30, and an amazing thing happened. My staff got impatient. They decided they didn't want to wait for me to show up, and they went off to their workplaces and their offices and started solving the problems that they had been asking me to solve. So I realized that something had changed, and their shift in their behavior made me wonder how I had been contributing to their seeming inability to organize their own work. And since that time, over the last 40 years, I've been working with people and coaching people to figure out how to unleash self-organization in their own workplaces and in their classrooms. So what do I mean by self-organization? Uh, self-organization is when uh, we expect that um, people can initiate and organize their own work. So basically, self-organization involves people taking initiative, and getting their work done on their own, that they know the purpose and mission of the organization they're working in, and they align that with that organization, and they um, can, they're self-aware in the sense that they know when they have to change their behavior in order to get better at their job. And when we do this, we get a big benefit because we have more time to do our own work. And the rest of the work gets done on its own, just like nature. And this isn't just for managers. This is also for teachers and for parents. So there are three keys to unlocking self-organization. One, the first one is to stop thinking your employees need your direction in order to be productive. Instead, start expecting self-organization as a basic norm. So when I had went to my second job, I was part of a team, and one of the team members basically didn't do anything. She kind of sat at her desk and waited to be told and asked what to do. And I thought that she might not have the ability to self-organize. And 
uh, I had almost given up on her. And then one day she came up to me and said, would you uh, be a fourth for our bridge game at lunchtime? Uh, because their fourth had called in sick. And I said, sure. And as I was watching her play bridge, I realized I had vastly underestimated her ability and her intelligence. She was totally self-organized at the bridge table. She was strategic. She was uh, won all of her hands. And I just thought to myself, okay, this is where she's been keeping the self-organization. It's been hanging out at noon at the bridge table. So I decided that I would start shifting my, my uh, relationship with her. So the next time she came up to me and asked what she should do, I paused, I sat back, and I said, I don't know, what do you think? And when I changed the way I asked questions and answered questions and directed her, she also changed her behavior. And she started initiating and she started bringing solutions with the problems that she saw. And this made us a much stronger team. It was great. And this is basically how it should work. This is how it works in nature. For example, when bees, uh, they like the hive at a certain temperature. And when bees, uh, when the temperature rises above a certain um, amount, the worker bees start flapping their wings faster in order to increase the circulation. And then the beehive cools down. Nobody is directing this. This is just an expected response to, an, to a situation that makes the beehive uncomfortable. So if we want to unleash self-organization in our work, what we want to do is change our expectations and expect it as a norm. So the second strategy key for unlocking self-organization is to get your ego out of your supervision and instead focus on outcomes and results. So going back to my first supervisor each story and my office staff lining up outside my door, when they did that, I used to feel kind of flattered and needed, and that was my ego talking. And I also, uh, when they asked me questions, I thought my ego wanted to answer it so they could see my own um, ability and experience and expertise and knowledge. And so when, uh, so when I did that, the problem was that it created a dependency on me. So instead of thinking for themselves, they started asking my ego what I thought. So I needed to shift that. And um, I had to, and I learned this great lesson from nature. So nature unleashes self-organization. It depends on self-organization, but it bookends that with a very clear purpose. So nature's purpose is to create life, the life of future generations, to support the life of future generations. And it is designed as a system to have every species and plant life support that. So when bees go out and seek nectar and pollinate fruits and vegetables, they're contributing to that larger purpose. Now, in our human organization, sometimes we don't connect, make that connection very strong. Um, and when that happens, what we get is a version of self-organization, but without the purpose helping to shape it and direct it. And I call that empowerment gone wrong. So anybody who's been in a staff meeting or um, a budget conversation where people are trying to get as many dollars as possible to their individual budgets without regard to the impact on the larger organization, you would have seen this empowerment gone wrong. So where do we find good lessons on how to get clear on purpose? Our military is known worldwide for its ability to continue to achieve mission when they get cut off from command and control. And that's because they're very clear about their mission objectives and they're very clear about their purpose. If you want to know whether you're clear about your purpose in your organization, you could ask yourself this question. If I was 
cut off or if I was absent from working with my team for a week or for a month? Would my team still be productive and would my team still be contributing to the purpose of the organization? And if your answer is no, they can't, they wouldn't, then you know that you have to get better at figuring out how do we talk about what we're trying to achieve together? What is our overall purpose of what we're trying to do? The third strategy is to stop micromanaging and start reinforcing self-organization. So bees, this is another great honeybee example. So when bees know that they're getting too crowded in their hive, the queen bee doesn't show up and start uh, directing how to find a new hive. The queen bee actually is totally out of it. The scouts, the scouting bees, anticipate the need for another move. And when they anticipate, these scouts start going out and looking for alternative spots to uh, hang out. And when they come back, if they go out and they find a really great home, what they do is they come back and then they do this kind of wiggle bee dance, I call it. So they move their bodies, they orient their bodies specifically in the hive in a certain way. And when they, and that communicates to all the other bees in the hive, how many, what the direction they should fly out of the hive and how, what the distance is to the new place. And then those other honeybees go off and explore see where the scouts are thinking is a good new home. And when they come back, if they agree with the location, they come back and join that dance. And then over time, there's this kind of decision that emerges with wide exploration and lots of vetting. And when they're ready, they swarm and they move. So uh, what would happen if we started expecting our staff to anticipate problems and solve them without any managerial intervention. What would that look like? However, organizations, partly because we're human, we kind of generate these micromanagers at work. So what do micromanagers do? They like to control and they like to tell people exactly what to do to accomplish things. And micromanagement doesn't reward self-organization. It rewards compliance. And when you have a whole lot of compliance going on in an organization, the micromanager is really busy telling everybody what to do, but there's no self-organization. The tricky thing about micromanagement is that sometimes it can come up from the bottom, not just down from the top. So when I was uh, taught um, classes and was a faculty member, Oftentimes, my students wanted me to micromanage their learning. They would ask things like, is this going to be on the test? Or how many pages should this paper be? Or they might say, what should I write my paper on? And basically, subtly, what they were asking me to do was to micromanage their learning. So they didn't have to put any stake in it. I wanted to create a classroom environment that worked more like the bees than like our traditional relationship between faculty and students. So I decided what would I reward? And I decided to give them 25% of their grade based on their ability to organize and direct their own learning and be willing to share and expand the learning of others in the class. I was basically trying to use the reward system to change the culture and environment of my classroom. And when I did that, they changed their behavior and their motivation for their behavior. Students started to uh, talk in class not to please me, but to demonstrate their own learning, their own observations, their own insights. They wrote papers, again, not to please me, but to demonstrate how they were integrating their learning. And this created a great environment for learning in our classroom. So if we, the third key to unlocking self-organization is to reward and recognize uh, self-organization when it happens. 
So just in summary, all we need to do, three simple things, is we need to expect self-organization is normal and can happen and everybody can do it. We need to be able to articulate our core purpose and help people connect their day-to-day -day work to that larger purpose. And then we need to uh, recognize and reward self-organization. And when we do that, when we make these shifts in our leadership, we create organizations and classrooms that work much more like nature does. So now I have a new Zen saying, sitting quietly, self-organizing spreads, learning flows, work gets done, we all thrive. Thank you.